Hello folks. Ah yes, so I'm trying to figure out why things look differently. Why it look, look, look different? Uh, because I've got my eyes on naturally. Okay, so where are we? We're in the book, um, The Politics of Guilt and Pity. We're in the, we've done the section, The Politics of Guilt. Now we're on to, oops, now we're on to The Politics of Pity. Uh, the second section, and we're in the third part, The Heresy of Love. Not The Power of Love, by somebody. Power of Love. You are my lady. I am your lady. You are my lady. Whenever you reach for me, I want to kick you my... Okay, The Heresy of Love and the New Tyranny. And the New Tyranny. Let's see. All right. Seems fine. All right. Make it so. What's up? Three. The heresy of love and the new tyranny. One of the fundamental and often repeated commandments of Scripture is the love of neighbours and of enemies. In Leviticus 19.18, personal acts of vengeance, taking the law into one's own hands, are forbidden. And as the positive aspect of this same statement, it is required that thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself, that this includes one's enemies, is made clear in verses 33 and 34. There are two especially prevalent misinterpretations of the biblical, biblical, biblical. There are two. There are two especially prevalent misinterpretations of the biblical law of love. The first may be called the monastic view. The, the love of monastic view. The love of neighbour in this perspective means the despising of one's life, of personal property and of creation itself out of a selfless love for God and neighbour. Its logical conclusion is an otherworldly perspective, a withdrawal from the world into a cell and the summoning of all men to share in the same conventional com conventual. and the summoning of all men to share in the same conventual communism. The true love of God and neighbour means a despising of things, a superiority to considerations of rights and property as mundane, and an assumption of voluntary poverty as the truly godly life. Roman Catholicism social gospel and liberal or modernist Presbyterianism, romantics and sentimentalists have been advocates of this concept of love with variations. The popularity of Francis of Assisi has been due to his extremely sentimental and non-theological application of this same principle. A throwing away of one's life, an abandon to sacrifice, this is true love from the... This is... Okay, I've been affected by this. This is true love from this point of view. Numerous corporations of a secular sort have been dedicated to this faith, such as the Onida and Kawea colonies, with notable problems ensuing. The unwritten premise immediately appears, which is basic to every misinterpretation of this commandment. To love your neighbour as yourself means to hate yourself, your life and property, and hence, inevitably, and ultimately, to hate your neighbour as yourself. The commandment to love is made, in essence, a law of hate because of this unwritten premise. The law of hate, masquerading as a law of love, is also basic to the second common misinterpretation best seen in Marxism, which calls for enforced sharing and enforced self-abnegation. Abnegation. 
Amalgation. Amalgation. Anastasia. Amalgation. Best seen it. And enforced self abnegation. In the first view, heaven is usually the remote reward and sometimes, in secular forms, a future paradise on earth. In the non-voluntary forms, the reward is more usually the future order on earth, a messianic state without God and, in essence, without a recognisable man. This... Some kind of noise going on there, outside... This enforced love and sharing will ostensibly eliminate all sin, misery and grief from the world and all problems of every kind. When perfect communism is attained, man will both have nothing and need nothing while theoretically possessing all things by virtue of forsaking all things. In this mysticism, an anthill society, not unlike the La Incas, not unlike the Incas, not not unlike, not unlike the Incas, not unlike the Incas, is envisioned. All right, sorry, losing my mind slightly. Some glossolalia for you. You're welcome. Not unlike the Incas is envisioned. From this point of view, victory in war must of necessity be turned into defeat as a moral obligation. And accordingly, the United States, having won in World War II, proceeded to conduct a radical program of sharing and self-abnegation in order to further a compulsive desire for this love-induced bankruptcy. The United Nations, the International Bank for Recon Reconstruction, the International Bank, the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development and other such agencies are monuments to this widespread faith. Part and parcel of it, too, are the sociological and literary demands that we love the criminal, the homosexual, the insane and the... The insane... Insane. The insane and the depraved, the cruel and the sadistic. And it has even been suggested that the West failed to love sufficiently, and hence created Hitler and Stalin. Not only is this law of love in essence a law of hate, but truly personal love is viciously attacked and condemned as charity, and hence degrading. A direct personal act of kindness or love towards the needy, and dis... Oh dear... A personal, personal acts of kindness or love towards a needy and deserving person is seen as a social affront, an attempt to evade social responsibility and a proud presumption. Indeed, in the 1960 state senatorial campaign in California, one politician waged a highly popular campaign in behalf of our senior citizens urging the repeal of the responsible relative law, which is an undue hardship on many families. Thus, children with means are to be relieved of any responsibility for the financial welfare of their parents as an act of love and social responsibility. Christ, on the other hand, made it clear that God was not honoured by any gift from one who failed to support his father or his mother. Matthew 15, 1-9, Mark 7, 9 to 13. Such conduct made the word of God of none effect, reduced it to a mockery by this pretended and hypocritical love of God's while parents were neglected.
But all such private acts of responsibility are now labelled, at the very least, a hardship and are regarded as social dereliction. This new law of love is much easier. Instead of the hardship of responsibility, it offers total irresponsibility to all men individually as a pathway to the responsibility of all men collectively. The true interpretation of the law of love taught by Scripture itself, Leviticus 19, 15 to 18, 33 to 37, Matthew 22, 34 to 40, Romans 13, 8 to 10, is very different from the emotional or social connotation read into it by these heresies. The second table of the law and all related commandments are briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. Romans 13.9 The law of love, therefore, is a summation of these commandments. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbour. Thou shalt not covet. Exodus 20.30 I can read. I can read. 13 to 17. Let us examine each of these more specifically. 1. Thou shalt not kill. The state is given the right to kill in terms of God given laws and principles and in it and in its defence and in its and in its defence and in its defence the individual having the gift of life must respect that same God-given life in others. Even as he loves and protects his own life, so he must grant that same privilege to others. He can kill only in defence of his life or property. Exodus 22, 2. 2. Thou shalt not commit adultery. The love and respect for one's own home and family means the same respect for and immunity of the homes of others, neighbours, friends, or enemies. Thou shalt not steal. Property is a God-given privilege and is to be... Property. Property. Property is a God-given privilege and is to be respected both for one's own sake and for others. Neither through personal acts, through agents, or by means of governmental activities, do we have the right to steal another man's property. 4. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Even as we want the protection of our own good name, so we must grant to others the immunity of reputation against false witness. 5. Thou shalt not covet. Because another may be more privileged than we are with respect to any of these God-given aspects of life does not entitle us to that inward covetousness, in essence, idolatry, Colossians 3.5, whereby a man hatefully seeks to pull down all those who are better than himself. Since this commandment so defines loving our neighbour as ourselves, it means clearly also that no man is capable of so loving his neighbour if he does not first love himself, if he has no respect for his God-given privileges of life, family, property and reputation, he is not likely to grant them to another. I managed to somehow put in an extra syllable into another, which is quite an achievement. One that speaks to, hear me now, speaks to, as I said again, speaks to ah, some, some, some amazing skills. Wow. Look at the skills. He's not likely to grant them to another. Thus, the commandment requires that man's person, family, property and reputation be granted this immunity from evil attack by word, thought or deed, that we grant this immunity to others even as we expect it for ourselves. The law of love is thus not voluntary or involuntary communism, but rather liberty and the essence of any true Bill of Rights. 
If any man's immunities are attacked, we have an obligation, as the parable of the Good Samaritan states, to answer responsively and affirmatively to the question, Who is my neighbour? Luke 10, 25-37 The good neighbour, the Samaritan, seeing a man robbed and wounded, offers charity, assistance to help the man on his feet again, and then passes on. Three things are notable. 1. The Good Samaritan shares no property, but reveals rather a sense of compassion, as the law of charity requires. 2. Samaritans and Jews had religious and racial differences and hated one another. The Samaritan did not change his opinion of the Jews. The Samaritan The Samaritan did not change his opinion of Jews. He showed respect for the person and person and needs person. The person and needs of the Jew. He showed respect for the person and needs of the Jew whose immunities had been assaulted and then passed on. 3. The Samaritan did not subsidize the Jew. He merely resent, he merely rescued He merely rescued him and then went his way. The modern heresy of love is the proclamation actually of a law of hate and inevitably so. The will to death and the hatred of self is inescapable for unregenerate man at war with God and man and with himself, guilt-ridden and in flight from life, reality and selfhood. The oblivion of nirvana was an inescapable conclusion for the Buddha to seek, haunted by karma as he was and hating his life as he did. Only he who loves God, fulfilling the first table of the law, can love himself and accordingly respect his neighbour's person and privileges and enjoy life and its bounty under God. The heresy of love takes the biblical declaration that God is love in isolation from all else whereby God defines himself and then reverses in its and then reverses reverses and then reverses now we're doing all right oh my god and then reverses it in meaning to conclude that love is God, and hence love is omnipotent. Accordingly, the hope of man's salvation is not the omnipotence of God, but the omnipotence of human love. This, in effect, makes the man of love omnipotent and supersuman. I was going to, I was going to say supersuman for sure. makes a man of love omnipotence and superhuman. Gandhi, for example, tranquilized himself by chewing a dung root, avoided the humanity of sex, and espoused the pacifism of love as a means to both social victory and the attainment of oblivion from selfhood and humanity. Not only is love omnipotence, but its omnipotence is, by definition, according to Anders Nigren in Agape and Eros, Spontaneous, self. Ah, my nose. So much itchiness. Spontaneous, selfless, and uncaused, that is, completely irrational. Such is God's agape or love, according to Nigrin, thereby ruling out the eternal decree and God's predestinating counsel and such must be man's love. Similarly, the canonic conception of Christ in Russian theology made the entrance of communism possible in that culture. Christ, ostensibly being virtuous and perfect by means of his emptying of himself of all power, a love of humiliation, a forsaking of property and of all prudence and common sense, and an adoption of an undiscriminating and promiscuous love, This counsel of love, according to the heresy, requires a supine submission to evil, for anger, 
resistance and conflict constitute the essence of sin and are also separating and discriminating attitudes. In a very mild expression of this heresy, Oren Arnold has written, There is no such thing as a church quarrel. If two factions of a congregation start quarrelling, they have automatically denied the Christian fellowship. In such thinking, all principles other than love are gone. Paul was thus wrong in quarrelling with the Judaizers and legalists and denied the Christian fellowship. Athanasius was sinful in upholding the full Trinitarian theology and Luther and Calvin wicked in destroying the unity of the church. Here again, another aspect of this law of hate masquerading as love appears. Its concern is for unity rather than truth or liberty. Hence, such thinking is strongly partisan to church unity and ecumenicity. And ecumenicity. Only partisan to church unity and ecumenicity as in itself good, irrespective of truth. It upholds the United Nations and world's peace at any price because love, peace and unity are more to be valued than truth or freedom. Divisiveness is thus the sin of... Yeah, okay, this is getting to the nub, but it's super relevant, but this distills it down. Divisiveness is thus the sin of sins in church and society, whereas truth is always divisive according to Jesus, the bearer of the discriminating sword of justice rather than the peace of compromise, surrender, and the reign of the lie. Matthew 10.34 this heresy of love ends finally in the new tyranny of love, in as rigid a compulsion as the world has yet seen. Whether he believes in voluntary and first No, no, no. No, 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 Holy smokes, what have I done? Freedom! All right, I just somehow lost that. Ugh. I'm sorry. So very sorry. Totally sorry. Divisiveness is thus the sin of sins in church and society, whereas truth is always divisive according to Jesus, the bearer of the discriminating sword of justice rather than the peace of compromise, surrender, and the reign of the and the and the, and the reign of the lie, and the reign of the lie, and the reign of the lie, Matthew ten thirty four. This heresy of love ends finally in the new tyranny of love, in as rigid a compulsion as the world has yet seen. Whether he believes in voluntary and personal love or in state-enforced love, the champion of this heresy demands what that... The champion of this heresy demands what not even God requires that ultimately every last person be compelled to submit to the power of love. The God of Scripture allows to the dignity of the creature, allows to the, allows, ah? The God of Scripture allows to the dignity of the creature's rebellion, okay, the security of hell. I, I just don't, that's quite involved as a sentence. The God of Scripture allows to the dignity of the creature's rebellion the security of hell, but no such privilege will be allowed to the enemies of this strange love. 
as one such theologian has stated it. The goal of the universe is the end of all estrange estrangement. I'm sorry, folks, this is just tough. The goal of the universe is the end of all estrangement, so that not only the demonic powers, but Satan himself will be finally loved into salvation. This love run amok will be a harp plucking angel will make. Oh, I'm sorry, folks, I'm just a little bit. This love run amok will make a harp plucking angel even of Satan. Man is thus made an automaton in the name of love. Love of self is revealed to be hatred of self and hatred of the integrity of self. A universal levelling is demanded and truth and man must be crushed under this juggernaut of hate that screams of love. That's... Mm, sorry, I'm just struggling a bit. This heresy of love will not permit man to love his family, property or himself. Whether preached from pulpit or senate or affirmed in psychiatric counselling, it is the counsel of death and despair and the foundation of a new tyranny. The meaning of Leviticus 19.18 is thus clear-cut. Thou shalt not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. I am Jehovah. Revised Version Personal acts of vengeance, taking the law into one's own hands, are forbidden in the first part of the law. Law and justice are to be administered only through the approved social and civil agencies. This is the negative aspect of the law of love. The positive aspect makes clear that, while justice in its penal aspects cannot be administered by the individual justice. Justice in its penal aspect cannot be administered by the individual. Justice in its positive aspect does involve the individual and rests firmly on the character of the people. A man must love and respect his God-given privileges of life, family, property and reputation, and must respect these same privileges in others, whether friends or enemies. Thus, to love one's enemy doesn't mean to feel an emotional attachment to him or to share one's property with him, but, in spite of personal hatred, however well-grounded, to respect his God-given immunities because of a love of God and a love of one's own self, out of a conviction that, because God is God, the truest justice begins with God and then manifests itself in the context of man's personal life. Oh, boy. Sorry to make that so uh, horribly painful for you all. I hope I didn't cause anybody too much or too deep a psychic wound by my jibber-jabbering. Positive aspect of just that was mind blowing. I think you'll agree. I mean, I don't know for a fact that you, you know, will agree, but I'm pretty sure you might. So, thanks for listening. If you like this work, if you believe that it's accomplishing something perhaps important, perhaps worthwhile, then do consider liking, sharing, commenting. And you can support this work financially by going to nathanteacher.com forward slash. forward slash donations. Hope to see you soon. Thanks very much. Goodbye now.